UFC 300 is almost here. And what a road it's been. We're closing in on eight years since UFC 200. Eight years of bone-rattling knockouts, of mind-bending submissions, of some of the finest displays of martial arts mastery the world has ever seen. Over that time, it's not an understatement to say we have been through a lot. 3,852 fights, 322 events, 148 championship bouts, some amongst the most legendary in this sport's history, some eh, not so much. But which of the 10 best, most memorable, most iconic, most action-packed, unmissable fights since the UFC's last centennial celebration? The team at MMA Fighting put it to a vote. What do we get right? What do we get wrong? Let us know in the comments below, because without further ado, let's jump into the list. These are the 10 best fights since UFC 200. Number 10, Islam Mahashev versus Alexander Volkanovsky won. In order for a high-level fight to evolve into a great legendary fight, it needs three things. It needs an electric crowd, it needs high stakes, and it needs two of the best fighters on planet Earth. And that is what the main event of UFC 284 delivered in spades. In the blue corner, pound for pound number one fighter Alexander Volkanovsky dared to go up in lightweight and challenge the seemingly unstoppable number two pound for pound fighter in the world and lightweight champion Islam Mahachev, who had just finished dethroning Charles Oliveira in front of a raucous crowd in Abu Dhabi in October. And what does he do? He calls for the number one pound for pound fighter across the world in Perth, Australia. Now, I know what you're thinking. H high level fight in prime time, North American time, but in, in Perth, the first fight was 7 a.m. Sunday. That crowd was there and that crowd was ready. So when Alex Volkanovsky made the walk in front of a roarous hometown crowd opposite the evil, booed, hated Islam Mahachev on Sunday morning in Perth, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Every twitch, every moment, every takedown, every submission attempt, every punch, every kick. It was as if everyone in that arena, including myself, was witnessing Anderson Silva front kick Vitor Belfort. It was as if John Jones was throwing those spinning elbows. It was as if Francis Ngannou was landing that uppercut. They weren't even throwing, and the crowd was on their feet for the entire 25-minute fight. Keep in mind, this is, these are the two best fighters in the world doing what they do best. It was high-level martial art at its finest. And while Islam Mahajev emerged victorious to claim that pound-for-pound -pound number one spot, no one in that arena felt cheated from what they had witnessed in one of the single best fights between the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world do what they do best down under. Number nine, Cub Swanson versus Duho Choi. All right, Cub Swanson versus Du Ho Choi, UFC 206, December 10th, 2016 in Toronto. Man, if you're looking for an all offense, very little if any defense fight, this is what you get with these 145 ponders for 15 minutes. This is one of those Wiley Vets versus the young up and comer rising star fights. People are doubting the Wiley veteran. Everyone's favoring the young up and comer and this one absolutely steals the show and it tells a lot that this makes the list as a three round fights. The only one on the list is three round fight. It's in the UFC Hall of Fame and it just goes to show you how crazy 2016 was. This fight actually finished third on our list for fight of the year. This one had it all. Wild exchanges, both guys getting hurt, blood, cartwheel kicks, ankle picks, and an absolutely on fire crowd in Toronto. The last 20 seconds of this fight is absolute freaking insanity. I remember watching this fight live on my cell phone and I was literally laughing out loud amongst a big group of people because I just could not believe what I was watching. This fight rules, and the way I describe it to people who have never seen it, it's like the breaking bad of three round fights. It starts off really good, kind of slow compared to the rest of the fight, but you could just feel it building. You know something big's about to happen. And then once the second round starts, it is all gas and no breaks. That is one of the wildest rounds you will ever watch. The third is just heart, will, and fortitude. And if you're a newer fan and you haven't seen this fight, please finish this video. Go watch this fight. You will thank me later. And as Cub Swanson, who gets the gritty veteran savvy win, said in his post-fight interview, don't ever question me again. Sir, we didn't, and we won't again. Hats off to both guys. Number eight, 
Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway 2. Max Holloway versus Dustin Poirier 2. It's one of those fights where all you need to do is hear the names involved to know that it's going to be an instant classic. Uh, it was a rematch from Max Holloway and Dustin Poirier 1, which happened in 2012. Uh, that was Max Holloway's first UFC fight, his debut in the UFC, and Dustin Poirier's fourth. Young in their careers, prospects on the rise, featherweights at the time. Fast forward seven years, and we're looking at two guys who have really established themselves meeting in a lightweight contest. You've got Max Holloway, who's now coming off wins over back-to-back uh, -back wins over Jose Aldo, and then a masterclass against Brian Ortega, who's moving up in weight to challenge for a second title uh, up at lightweight. And you've got Dustin Poirier, who's reeling off wins against the likes of Eddie Alvarez and Anthony Pettis and Justin Gaethje, and really looking like the guy that we've come to know in terms of stalwart of the lightweight division, Dustin Poirier. Getting his first crack at UFC gold, getting that opportunity that has eluded him for so long. Certainly, you know, an interim title in, in capacity, but something that I think meant a lot to Dustin Poirier at the time. And you could see it from the emotion uh, that was all over him for fight week and then after the fight. Between the two men, they had 856 strikes attempted, 827 of them significant. Right now, here today, still in 2024, that's good for the third most strikes ever attempted all time and the third most significant strikes ever attempted of all time. Just an absolute back and forth war uh, between two of our most technical and clean and exciting strikers that we have in the UFC and in all of MMA. Uh, I think if you just look at the scorecards, this is one of those fights that you're really not going to get the full picture about. You're going to you're going to see the 49 46 Dustin Poirier and not realize that it was actually Max kind of pushing the pace and giving Dustin all he could handle and really being the one to establish the tempo of the fight. And to his credit, Dustin Poirier going against one of the like all time tempo setters in Max was able to hang with him. And it ultimately came down to, in my opinion, and I think many others who are looking at this fight, the counters and the power of Dustin Poirier just ended up being too much for Max Holloway. But man. What an absolute battle back and forth. And I think if, if you're somebody who experienced it at the time, if you were even lucky enough to be in the arena in Atlanta and get to see this and get to see Israel Asanya and Kelvin Gastelum, you were in for a special one. And you know, I, I in fact, I'd go so far as to say, I think there's some people who scored that fight in real time for Max Holloway. So don't really trust the scorecards on this one because this was one of the great back and forth battles that we've ever had. Number seven, Robert Whitaker versus Yoel Romero too. What an emotional roller coaster ride this build and this fight was because it took a little bit of wind out of the sails with Yoel Romero missing weight, but man, what a battle these two guys had. Whitaker starts off strong. He wins the first two rounds. Looks like he's cruising. He's landing good shots. He completely swells and shuts the eye of Yoel Romero. But those are the first two rounds, my friends, because as longtime fans know, third round Yoel Romero, he's a different animal. He's a mythical creature, which is something Robert Whitaker found out about as Romero badly hurts Whitaker in the third, nearly gets him out of there, but Whitaker toughs it out. He survives. And then we move on to the fourth round and Romero is just absolutely gassed from the tail end of the third through the fourth. And you think to yourself, Whitaker is just going to cruise through the fifth. Romero is just so tired. But then Romero taps into that third round animal, badly hurts Whitaker in the final stanza. And the then middleweight champion who basically fought 20 plus minutes of that fight against that madman without his right hand and even the lower part of his right arm, as he said in this post fight interview, because he hurt it early in the fight, hangs on to survive and gets to the final horn. Robert Whitaker goes on to win a split decision and a bit of a controversial one because neither Chris Lee, Sal Diamato, or Brian Pachillo, who were scoring the fight cage side, neither gave Romero a 10-8 round in the third or the fifth. And on MMA decisions, only five media members scored the fight for Robert Whitaker, eight scored it a draw, which is how I scored it watching it live, and 15 media members scored it for Yoel Romero. Scorecards and opinions aside, this fight was a grueling, nasty battle and it showed 41-year-old Yoel Romero is a superhuman and 27-year-old Robert Whitaker is the real deal and tougher than a $2 steak. This fight is great. Number six, Justin Gaethje versus Michael Johnson. We always talk about the ones we'll never forget. 
this, I mean, this for me is one that I will never forget. I mean, I'm the Arizona guy, and I'll tell you for a good couple of years there, I felt like I was taking crazy pills with how much I was carrying water for Justin Gaethje when no one else would. Because this dude was this dude from the word go. Like from the beginning, Justin Gaethje was this lunatic. He was basically a folklore legend around here before he was ever in the UFC. Like I saw him light a house show on fire in Rage of the Cage. I saw him make a small theater of a thousand people feel like a stadium of a hundred thousand. You look at that Luis Palomino series back to back in, in World Series of Fighting, and hell, I don't know if downtown Phoenix has ever recovered from that. Like this man was entertainment personified from jump and it drove me insane how much he would get discredited, how much he would get discarded in the national, the global conversation when he was just out here torching fools, just putting the fear of God into people. My favorite moments with those early Justin Gaethje fights were always the split second and you could see it in their eyes every time, that split second when the other guy realized, oh, this is real. This dude isn't gonna stop. Like he is going to be here in my face, smashing leg kicks, just being a straight demon until either I wilt or I break. So you gotta imagine by 2017 rolls around, here we go. Justin Gaethje finally has a chance to introduce himself to this UFC audience. And Michael Johnson is out here doing that same old thing that everybody does, trying to act like this hell on wheel style isn't gonna work for him and oh lord, it was electric. It was one of the loudest crowds I have ever heard in my life at that tough finale, and one of the most breathtaking welcome to the UFC moments we have ever seen. And the best thing, the, the best thing about all of it is that it was pure Justin Gaethje through and through. It was exactly what it needed to be and what it should have been. I promise you, if you haven't seen Justin Gaethje versus Michael Johnson, go watch it after you watch this video. It's basically the greatest UFC origin story you could imagine. And goddamn, it kind of felt like vindication for this Arizona boy. Like performance of the night, fight of the night, fight of the year, give it all the bonuses, call it whatever you want. By the end of that weekend, there was no question. We all knew, everyone knew. A new boogeyman had arrived at 155. Number five, Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje won. Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje are two of the most exciting fighters in MMA history. And so even... Even not knowing what we know now, just knowing what we knew then, heading into UFC on Fox 29, the expectations were super high. We're talking about the highlight Justin Gaethje had become that guy. And Poirier, everyone loved Dustin Poirier. And even by those lofty standards, this fight still delivers. If you have not watched it, do yourself a favor. Go back and watch all these two dudes' fights, but particularly this one, because this is Justin Gaethje at his most maniacal, and Poirier is just ascending into a guy who can take advantage of it. And so it, it's just hell on wheels for, for however long the fight goes on. They are clashing at each other. It's absolute scenes. Gaethje is chopping the legs. Poirier is just hitting him with the hands. It's one of the most exciting fights, just minute for minute that you'll ever get. And then it ends so suddenly in the fourth round, like the, the momentum seems to change. And, and there we have it. Dustin Boyer has truly ascended and arrived as must see television as an elite guy in this division. And Gaethje ultimately has to go back to the drawing board and it works out. But this fight is everything you want in a mixed martial arts contest in modern day MMA. And it's well deserving of being on this list. Number four, Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz 2. August 20th, 2016, T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. Five months after their stunning first encounter that saw Nate Diaz humble Conor McGregor and hand him his first UFC loss, they stepped to the octagon again for a rematch that took fight hype to another level. Uh, this wasn't cult hero Nate facing off with McGregor. This was red carpet mainstream megastar Nate versus one of the most famous combat sports stars of all time. Uh, people tend to scoff at this one these days, maybe because they were unhappy with McGregor winning a close decision. But bell to bell, this is one of the most breathtaking brawls you'll ever see. It somehow surpassed the hype despite being one of the most highly anticipated rematches in MMA history. You had a more patient McGregor knocking Diaz down in rounds one and two, and then a fearsome Diaz at his best in round three, pointing, laughing, taunting, and yes, slapping. Somehow, 
McGregor got a second or a third win to survive a Diaz flurry that looked like it would have finished off any other version of Notorious, but he also battled back in the championship rounds and eventually prevailed on the scorecards. It was unbelievable. Afterwards, McGregor told Joe Rogan, it's one and one, regroup, we'll do it again. Since then, we've had plenty of teases that have gone nowhere, but if you're a fight fan, you have to still be hoping that in some way, somewhere, somehow, McGregor and Diaz will throw down one more time. Number three, Israel Adesanya versus Calvin Gastelum. When we first set out to do this and we got to pick the fights we wanted to talk about, the only one that I cared like deeply about fight about fighting for, about getting to speak on, was Israel Adesanya versus Calvin Gastelum at UFC 236. This one holds a special place in my heart because I was in attendance. This happened in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was there with Shaheen Al Shadi, and I can tell you firsthand, it's the most insane experience I've ever had watching fist fights in my life. And I wasn't the only one. Everyone on Media Row goes out for the, the main and the co-main and we watched it. And the feeling after these two dudes did what they did that evening is something I will never forget. After that fight is over, we're all kind of staring at each other, almost as if we are drunk from the emotional dump that that fight was. The ebbs and the flows. Is he in the heading into the fifth round saying, I'm willing to die in here to himself before the round starts? An unbelievable event that happened to the point where none of us could really even register it. And I think the thing that drives it home the most for me is another fight that we have on this list of best fights happened later that evening. This was the co-main event. The main event was Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway to uh, an amazing fight outright in its own. And as I watched that fight on that evening in Atlanta, Georgia, I thought to myself, this fight's incredible. And I could not emotionally connect because all of my energy had been dumped out in what Israel Adesanya and Kelvin Gastelum had done to each other. It is one of, bar none, the best fights that has ever taken place and easily deserving of being one of the three best fights in the history of the sport, much less since UFC 200. Number two, Zhang Weili versus Joanna Yunjaychik one. 783 strikes thrown, 366 strikes landed, one entirely nightmarish creature sprouting like a demon's horn out of a Hall of Famer's head. Go ahead and call it the single greatest women's fight in the history of human civilization if you want, but somehow even that doesn't do it justice. Because what Zhang Wei Li and Yuan and Jacek gave us at UFC 248 in 2020 was one of the greatest fights of all time, period, full stop, no qualifiers needed. Looking back, it still doesn't even really make sense. How many of the fights on this list after their brilliant sprints out of the gates faded down the stretch because the human body is only capable of so much. But this 25 minutes straight of pure desperation, no letdown in the championship rounds, no quit, no friendly agreement to clinch, if only for a half second to let everyone in the whole damn arena be able to catch their breaths. Nah, at some point, the truly great fights cease being fights and elevate into something more. And make no mistake, Zhang versus Yoan Jacek ascended to that higher plane. Number one, Yuri Prohashka versus Glover Teixeira. What do you get when you put a man with lunchboxes for hands and a suffocating ground game up against a real-life samurai with razor blades for elbows? You get Glover Teixeira versus Yuri Prohashka at UFC 275 in Singapore, one of, if not the greatest fights you will ever witness. Now, Glover Teixeira, the reigning UFC light heavyweight champion, had just completed his life submission by claiming that UFC gold in October. Yuri Prohashka, though, who rose to fame during his time in Rising, where he dispatched opponents with ease and violence and just beautiful anarchy, had made his UFC debut with back-to-back -back finishes where he dispatched former contenders Dominic Reyes and Vulcan Ozdemir. Now, when these two just warriors stepped into that in, into the Singapore Indoor Stadium, absolute madness unfolded. Out went all technique, out went all game plans. It was kill or be killed with every punch, with every elbow, with every flying knee, with every takedown, with every ground and pound, with every submission attempt. That crowd in Singapore rose higher and higher and higher. 
again, out the door went technique. If you are a fan of martial arts, if you are a fan of technique and perfection, this is not the fight for you. But if you are a fan of just two of the greatest fighters to ever live, throwing everything but the kitchen sink at each other, then this is for you. Glove to share, of course, had full mount in the final round only to be reversed and submitted by Yuri Prohaska in one of, again, the greatest submissions you'll ever see. And Yuri hated his performance because he said it wasn't perfect, but to us, the fans, it was perfect. It was what we needed. Crowds were back in session. Fans were in attendance. Everyone tuned in to watch this pay-per-view and they delivered. Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, kickboxing, just beautiful MMA at its finest. Yuri Prohaska left the champion, but Glove Teixeira left a legend for putting it all on the line and welcoming in one of the most dangerous men on the, on the planet and pushing him to his absolute limit. And that is why it is the single greatest fight since UFC 200.